So, the, uh, the last plenary session, um, we're going to hear from all of the clusters, uh, looking at, hopefully, capacity in the, in the form of, of uh, physical capacity for CO2 transport and storage. Uh, just a, a warning to all of the cluster presenters, we, we're a bit short of time, so, so please keep the time. And then I was going to say no advertising, but uh, I'm not sure that would really work in a, in a, in a bunch of clusters uh, competing for, for, for funding and that, but uh, we'll see how it goes. So I think we'll run in the, in the order that we've got in the program uh, for presentations, and then we'll have some time for an interesting uh, discussion session afterwards, I hope. So, um, Ben. Ben Keck from the Northeast Cluster. Uh, the floor is yours. Morning, everyone. And uh, firstly, thanks very much for having me here. Uh, my name is Ben Keck, and I work for BP, uh, specifically on the East Coast Cluster. I've been on this uh, project uh, for about three years now. Some of you may have heard me talk uh, in some of the other webinars uh, by the UKCCSRC, by the UKRI, and also a few, a few other venues. So I'm just going to talk about a few things here today, uh, just to kind of give you a bit of an introduction of what exactly is the East Coast Cluster uh, and the Northern Endurance Partnership, which is the transportation and storage company. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the uh, kind of benefits the project will generate and a bit about the status uh, where we are at now. For those who have heard about this before, you know, I've, I've, you might have seen this slide. It's, it's, it's kind of used very widely. It's on our website as well. Uh, and uh, I've put in some, some green wording there to just kind of give you a flavor as to some updates, uh, the most recent updates of what's been going on. So kind of very simply, East Coast Cluster is about taking Teesside and Humber uh, industrial clusters, which together constitute about 50% of total UK uh, heavy industry uh, emissions, um, and uh, uh, transporting and sending CO2 to uh, a reservoir, which is uh, starting with the Endurance Reservoir, uh, in the Southern North Sea, which ha, uh, has been part appraised, uh, and then expanding onto a number of other stores that has been identified uh, in the Southern North Sea. So if you look at it from a stores project, it would pr pr frequently go transportation and storage. But if I look at it from the stores, uh, it's, it's Southern North Sea has plenty of uh, geological storage. Uh, and if we kind of work back from there, it is roughly, roughly, roughly equidistant uh, between uh, uh, Teesside and Humber. So uh, why not have one storage area serve both clusters, which will create a huge impact as well because it's about 50% of uh, the total emissions. But that something of the kind of scale uh, and the, uh, the diversity uh, in terms of the, the types of industries in both, both sites are quite different industries um, would allow us to really scale this up and uh, create a deployment project uh, that would be the largest you know, until, until we build it largest in the world uh, and largest in terms of uh, scale. And then kind of if we bring the, the kind of right companies together, uh, it's uh, BP leading this, uh, but it's also a huge number of companies with uh, quite a lot of experience in CCS. So you've got Equinor, uh, kind of Sleipner being an obvious example, Shell with uh, Quest and also the involvement in Gorgon, uh, and then uh, Total Energies who are also involved in uh, Northern Lights. Uh, and then National Grid was uh, involved with the part, previous White Rose project. And also, obviously, a lot of uh, these companies, including uh, my own, have been uh, sort of burnt in the past with previous CCS demonstrations. But uh, I think the learning and the persistence there means that hopefully it's third time lucky uh, that we can bring all of the uh, past experience uh, to bear here. Uh, a couple of things that in green there that you can see. So what's really, uh, we, we were selected into track one back in October last year, together with uh, the HiNet project. Uh, what's, what's changed is that uh, the uh, phase two eligible projects <clears throat> have, has been announced by BASE uh, just uh, last month. And uh, there are 14 uh, phase two eligible projects up to, with about up to 14 MTPA in Teesside <clears throat> and about 11 in Humber, uh, but going up to 12 MTPA. So together, that's about uh, 20, 24 MTPA. Uh, and uh, that's far in excess in terms of demand to uh, the kind of storage potential that we've got right now. So we're kind of a storage constraint uh, in some sense, uh, but obviously it's, it's a good problem to have, but there's a lot more demand from industry uh, for the transportation and storage network. Uh, in terms of the uh, kind of cluster sequencing process, these projects, they exclude uh, uh, BACs, 
which is uh, Drax is the uh, kind of largest emitter in the Humber region uh, because of the, the progress of the business model. So they primarily uh, power CCS, hydrogen and industrial carbon capture. So a little bit about uh, some of the, <coughs> the kind of economic uh, headlines. And there's just three main things I want to talk about here other than the kind of promotional piece, which is what I heard from, from some of the, some of the uh, discussions uh, at this conference. The first was uh, from uh, Dr. Karen uh, about a just transition and the, net, and the net gross value added to economy. Uh, what I heard was transportation and storage part uh, is about transferring uh, existing skills uh, from the, the oil and gas industries, and it's represented by the kind of companies in the East Coast cluster. Uh, in the Northern Endurance Partnership Transportation and Storage Company in particular. Uh, and obviously, in all cases of uh, the, so that Scottish cluster modeling uh, that I heard this morning, it's, it's been net positive uh, gross value added to the economy. Uh, so that's kind of positive news. We'll be starting a new industry here. Uh, the second thing <clears throat> I just want to uh, touch on was, I think Dr. Jed Roberts mentioned yesterday about EDI, uh, uh, Equity uh, Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, I guess I guess I just have one question for the audience here, <clears throat> which is amongst all the industries in transportation and storage with pipelines, uh, pumps and compressors, uh, and the, the subsurface, uh, which do you think has the highest proportion of our representation by women? Which part of the TNS chain? Any any volunteers? Enough coffee? Injection, yeah, okay. Transportation, right? Well, so the answer is, uh, is storage, right? So our subsurface team is uh, led by a woman, our subsurface manager. We have uh, more than 50% of the subsurface team are women. The uh, senior geologists and senior geophysicists are women. Uh, and it's a very good example as the mirror, at least within BP, uh, what our subsurface organization looks like, which is 50% or more are women. And it's a, uh, I would say in the transportation and st food storage chain, that's the part that actually has uh, the, the best representation and best uh, proportion. Uh, so uh, as, as a just transition, right, where we've got the skills uh, in the UK, uh, particularly around the subsurface, that, that makes for, I think, uh, a, a kind of a really good way to actually transition the, the skills from the upstream hydrocarbon industry into a new carbon ca capture and storage industry. Uh, and then the last uh, piece of research that we are actually uh, actively involved in uh, is the uh, National Oceanography Center's uh, uh, lander monitoring uh, for uh, CO2 monitoring uh, at the seabed as part of our monitoring plan. Uh, so I, I think whilst we're not working directly with, uh, with Alison, uh, we have a, a piece of uh, a work stream on developing that as part of our core monitoring plan. So some kind of real direct uh, outputs uh, from the research uh, that's being sponsored by the UK CCSRC here, being implemented on a real deployment project. And I guess my last uh, slide is just on, you know, what does it actually look like at those sites? You know, you hear a lot about leveling up, uh, about regeneration. I was talking to, uh, to uh, Professor Yong Yen, uh, who, who studied in T-Site as well. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a lot of it's about rejuvenating uh, the kind of chemical industries, for example, in T-Site that has, uh, that has uh, gone abroad over time and bringing a new industry. We've got a, a really large site here. T site T Works, for example, is the uh, the, the largest um, uh, kind of re brownfield land being redeveloped in Europe, uh, industrial land, and it's a, the fourth busiest port uh, in the UK. It's also got free port status. And compared to uh, back in December, uh, where, where, where I last talked about this project, uh, we've got six feet contracts. Uh, that has been awarded uh, across both BP and National Grid. And you've got about five to six uh, engineering sites across the country in operation right now, going through the feed process, front end engineering definition, uh, with literally hundreds of engineers uh, working on the, the planning and designing of this project right now. So hopefully this time around, we do get to sanction and we do get to uh, put in pipelines that uh, James is going to get to hug. Um, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll end uh, my presentation. Thank you so much for having me um, and thanks for being so accommodating with the, the virtual hookup. If there's been one 
positive that has come from COVID is that um, people are, are able to, to do this um, and, and make it possible for me to join. So thank you very much um, to everyone and really lovely to be back talking to the, the team at UKCCSRC. Um, okay, I'm going to whiz through this just to keep us on, on track. So um, I'm just going to do a, a quick introduction to the Scottish cluster and why um, it's really the, the transportation and storage system um, for the Scottish cluster has been uh, designed for growth. So if we can skip on to the next slide, please. So the Scottish cluster was designed for growth and it's built around the ACORN CO2 transportation and storage system, which really, if we start by looking at the, the storage site, the ACORN CO2 storage site, which is the, the one that we're going to first be starting with. That's been studied and developed over a period of over 15 years and really building on very detailed investigations from previous rounds of, of CCS development. Now that storage resource itself is connected by three major offshore gas transportation systems and they're ready and suitable for reuse. And because of those existing pipelines, which have a combined capacity of over 20 million tonnes per year um, of CO2 that can be transported through them. Um, and the replacement cost of those, uh, those three offshore pipelines is estimated at more than three, uh, sorry, 700 million. Those connections, um, plus the connections to the major gas import hubs and the potential to reuse existing gas feeders onshore, all of these things um, mean that you've got this system which which allows for growth and ver for quick growth and development. Um, these pipelines can be used for transmission, sorry, those feeder pipelines can be used for transmission of either or both carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So a really interesting um, system beginning to emerge. That existing infrastructure all unlocks access to over 30% of the UK's total CO2 storage resource, which is within 50 kilometres of those installed, that installed Acorn pipeline corridor. So really, you know, you're offering a wide diversity of storage development options and also creating a, a major strategic resource opportunity. So as you were hearing earlier from Ben, you know, one of the, the, the challenges and the issues for, for the UK um, is a really positive challenge to have is that you know there's oversubscription for um for for the availability of, of co2 so the the really critical thing when we're thinking about these transportation and storage systems is having access to this um to, to these great storage sites that we know exist um across the, the sort of east coast of the um the central north sea and, and the north sea more generally so the transportation and storage system is also designed around access to a deep water port connection, um, and that's to facilitate import of CO2 by ship from around the UK, but also potentially from Europe as well. And for the, the ACORN project, we're anticipating that eventually one in every two tonnes that we inject will actually arrive by ship once, once the project is fully um, operational. If we can flick to the next slide, please. Thank you. So just my, my last major point really is that the, the transportation and storage system is focused on subsea development. So we kind of call it the, the Norwegian model, um, but basically you're not, you're not using uh, platforms. So we're, we're trying to eliminate this sort of the, the fairly significant um, capital and operating costs that are associated with those fixed platform infrastructures and simplifying the, the decommissioning process. Also, the added benefit for, for us is that we're using less steel and it lowers the embedded carbon content of the developments that we have. Um, also, there's a significant reduction in the personnel risk and the aviation um, emissions associated with travel to and from offshore platforms. So that subsea development um, and you know having everything is as sort of minimalistic as possible in terms of reusing existing infrastructure and, and using those subsea developments is, is important for us in terms of how we're looking to develop that CO2 transportation storage system. And we can move to the next slide, please. 
So just a really quick summary, um, Scottish Cluster covers an area as large as all of the other UK clusters combined. So it's geographically quite different to a number of the other clusters that you're going to hear from today. It also has access to a really huge storage resource and transport um, infrastructure of international significance. Then it's the first CCS project in Europe to have been granted the project of common interest status by the European Union. And just to final point, it's a, it's a cluster and a transportation and storage system that has been designed for growth. And if you could just flick to my last slide, please, just to make sure that we keep all of the, everybody sweet and happy, let you know who, who are the partners behind the ACORN project and where the, the government support is coming from. And then final one should just be um, some contact details. Thanks, John. Thank you very much, John. Uh, morning, everybody. My name is Matthew Rhodes. I lead the Black Country Industrial Cluster on behalf of um, the Local Enterprise Partnership. Uh, we, we have three universities in our partnership, Birmingham, Warwick and Loughborough. Uh, and we're also supported by a wide network of industrial partners um, and the, the West Midlands Mayor, uh, very, very supportive of our project as well. We can have my first slide or do I, do I do that from here? Yeah. Oh, this is our point of, of, of departure. Um, this is a map of uh, energy intense businesses in the Midlands, the whole Midlands. You can see the black country um, outlined at the kind of middle bottom left there. Um, these are businesses that think of themselves as energy intense. So it's a slightly different definition sometimes from the government. But basically, for them, energy will be more than 10% of their costs. And this is before the last six months of, of rises. And it's critical to their um, international competitiveness. Um, three things to note about them. Uh, there are a lot of them, uh, particularly in the black country and, and Birmingham. They're heavily integrated into residential places. So actually, it's the same place that you've got lots of houses and commercial um, sites. And they're very varied. So the, the map on the right there, different colours, different types of sectors. But the black country, uh, very strong heritage in metal uh, processing. Uh, so foundries and forging, that kind of stuff. But also chemicals, food uh, and construction products. So some of our biggest um, partners in the uh, project are making bricks, big kilns and that kind of activity as well. Um, so uh, it's a slightly different cluster from the others, and we, we feel we make a distinctive contribution to the, the cluster decarbonisation project from, from a national perspective. We represent the 50% of the manufacturing economy, essentially, that, that lies outside uh, the existing clusters. Um, and we, we've, but, and, and we, we have quite a big uh, economic contribution, so more than 65,000 people in the black country employed uh, in those energy intense businesses, more than three and a half thousand of them, eight billion pounds of, of turnover. Um, we're, the, the contributions we're making, I think, to, to the, the wider uh, national programme, we're a weather vane for the impact of all these investments in Scotland and the northeast and northwest on industry in the rest of the country. So what does that, how, how do we respond to it? Um, as a, just as a, a passive um, piece of information, really, into all the work that, that you're doing. What, what impact does that have on our economy? Uh, but the other thing we're doing, and I guess the reason we're here, is we, we feel that we should respond positively to that. So what we're trying to do through our cluster projects is essentially come up with a business model uh, in, in the broadest sense for decarbonising an industrial cluster like the black country or the rest of the UK economy. And that's, that's quite an interesting process. Um, from the perspective of... An individual firm in our in our world, um, in the middle of this slide, you can see the obvious decarbonisation pathways for industrial electrification. One way of doing it: um, carbon capture, but with non-pipeline transport, probably because we're unlikely to get the infrastructure from the clusters for, for a while, and fuel switching to hydrogen. So those are the kind of core technical options that that our uh, cluster is looking at. Um, but all of those things, I'll come on to this in a minute, are likely to be slightly more expensive, more complex, probably involve higher costs than for the other clusters, partly because our initial configuration is so difficult to work with that the, the sites aren't necessarily in the right places, which leads on to kind of option four for everybody, which is move. And, and then the question is, where do you move to? Do you move to a better place within the West Midlands, where all your skills are, where your ecosystems are, or do you move to another country? Um, or do you move to one of the other clusters uh, around the, the UK? Those kind of questions. Just to give you a bit, a bit of 
data, which some people find surprising, uh, more than 50% of our output is exported globally. So most of these businesses are in global supply chains and, and they're fully integrated into automotive, aerospace, those kind of um, sectors. Um, so this is our this is where we're, we're, we're headed at the moment, um, and I just wanted to make the point here that the dependence on national infrastructure and policy decisions is, is really really strong for, for what we're doing. So uh, in some ways this is common sense. Um, we're looking to decarbonize as much by electrification as possible because that should be uh, the, the the most sensible and and risk mitigating route, I guess, but it's very sensitive to industrial electricity costs. So if industrial electricity costs persist to be that much higher than gas and the alternatives, then that doesn't make sense as an investment for, for most of our uh, cluster. Um, we, we have to be willing to reconfigure um, align with an industrial strategy, which maybe says we don't do or we don't try and grow in some sectors, industrial sectors at all in the future. We focus on things where we're, we're likely to have strengths. Uh, and that's a really positive outcome of this project. We're, we're actually finding positive reasons to put our spatial organisation into a more sensible uh, form. There's, there's a lot, awful lot of businesses kind of stuck in housing estates that could be better located in, in industrial areas. So restructuring, um, innovation, really interested in small scale carbon capture, hydrogen generation, and, and probably at hubs where we can either ultimately get a pipeline into them or um, do uh, carbon uh, non-pipeline transport and then be flexible and look at all these options for non-pipeline transport. So finally, uh, we're, and we're progressing down this road, so we're, we're looking at maximising the use of carbon locally. We've got a partner in our project, District Eating, who do uh, urban agriculture, uh, vertical farms and so on, uh, and reuse of carbon in, in food uh, manufacture. And we're really interested in, in the, the smaller scale carbon capture technologies. Transport and storage really critical, um, but the orders of magnitude look, point again and again to actually, under current business models, it doesn't make sense to stay where we are. Most of our businesses that are, are serious about um, or have serious dependence on energy uh, and carbon probably be better relocating. So the question to the UK government is how you handle that uh, and how we manage that over the next 20 years. Thank you. Just to keep it my usual format, I do things a bit different. We're doing a double act. <laughs> um, so I'm going to, where's my clicker? There we go. Um, just to kick off, I'm going to kick off with um, an introduction to what's going on with the Solent Cluster itself. And then we're going to pass on to Tamara, who's going to give you a little bit of insight into one of the challenges, one of the key challenges we face as a cluster, which is the shipping of CO2. OK, so this all built on a project um, where, oh, hey, oh, that was sensitive enough. <laughs> Um, where Tamara is the postdoc working on this project. We are, um, I'm one of the co-investigators. It's led by uh, Professor Damon Teagle at the Southampton Marine and Maritime Institute. Um, and we are also supported by uh, Professor Stephen Turnock as well at the university. And in terms of why we need to do this, well, as a Solent cluster um, itself, it is on the map, okay? I, I recognize this is an old date. So actually <laughs> a number of our cluster leads are probably going, these numbers have changed recently. Um, so we're actually up at about 3.5 uh, um, megatons of CO2 a year if we, when you update the data. Um, but we are there. We are a cluster and we've got one major source point. We have others as well. We've got Marchwood uh, combined gas uh, plant, but we have Forley, which is our ExxonMobil um, uh, oil refinery. OK, so as a as a lead source point, we have a massive network of cluster uh, companies, SMEs all the way up to this single source point that should be working together to create this cluster. And actually, a couple of years ago, I stood not necessarily here, but somewhere else. I was like, so as a cluster, we're doing lots at the university. <laughs> and that was kind of it. But I'm very pleased to sort of say there is a lot of things happening at the moment. So since then, as a cluster, we are developing. OK, so as of last uh, December, a memorandum of understanding was actually issued and signed up by uh, ExxonMobil, Green Investment Group and SGN, Scottish Gas Network, to actually explore the feasibility of a hydrogen network within the Solent region. OK, so this could be spanning as far as potentially um, the Portsmouth over to Bournemouth in the long run. Now, it's so early on, we're still very, very early in our development. We are working with other clusters to try to accelerate the, the development of these roadmaps. In fact, this feasibility study was done by WSP as well. Um, so 
all of this is fed in to try to accelerate our performance through. But essentially, what we have found is from the initial study, there is potential to, uh, to show, to capture a hydrogen demand um, of 37,000 uh, gigawatt hours by 2050. OK, so we've got a massive demand for this. And this includes 800,000 homes potentially across the south of England as well, for demand for heat uh, supporting that. Um, now, this will involve the capture of 2 million tonnes of CO2 initially, OK, developing as the programme goes um, and essentially um, producing uh, 4.3 uh, uh, terawatt hours of hydrogen per year. All right. So we have a lot of potential down here as a cluster and things are happening, but we're still very early on. So we're one of the ones who are learning by everyone. Um, so but one of the key challenges is we don't have access to these these store points very readily. So we have to follow the challenge of shipping. There are so many challenges that we face alongside South Wales in terms of the structural onboard uh, challenges and, and the off uh, onshore uh, infrastructural challenges as well. Okay, so this is where Tamara comes in. She's a postdoc for an IDRIC project that was funded last year, which is a ports to pipeline project. Um, and I'll pop that there. And then uh, called, um, yeah, CO2 from port to pipeline. And then she'll give you an introduction to what we're planning on doing, which will be supporting all of the various clusters at some point, whether source or receivers. So, go for Tamara. So to be able to follow the national strategy, net zero strategy, and store around 50 megatons per year by 2035. The, having the shipping organized for shipping the CO2 is crucial activity to uh, remain resilient in 2030s uh, and, and maintain carbon capture and storage according to the strategy. Now to enable shipping of CO2, uh, shipping needs to be captured in a business strategy of both uh, the capture side of CCUS and storage side in, in both of these business models because shipping communicates with those sides. Uh, we are developing a techno-economical model to enable CO2 uh, to optimal uh, CO2 shipping within the UK between ports and geological stores. And the scope of our model is on the shipping side. However, we will look in the future ports and communication between shipping and ports, the communication between shipping and geological stores. To enable that, we will uh, look into different case scenarios, which will use variables that impact ship design. And those are, um, the, the for the ship variables, it will be, different propulsion systems. So we will look into the energy of shipping. However, we will also look into ports and ports operations and holistically the whole life cycle of production of different types of ships. Our model will look into port efficiency to minimize ship waiting time. And that is uh, connected with industrial delivery of CO2 to ports. To, uh, the, ability of ports to store CO2. Um, what we don't know is the timeline. Of, we, we know on annual basis what we can expect of CO2 quantities. We do not know the timelines when this CO2 is going to be delivered to ports. So when is industry expecting us to, to ship their CO2? Um, well, we know the uh, amount that can be stored and that the gas storages need constant flow. Therefore, if I go back to the uh, first slide, we are also looking into the possibility of CO2 floating store at the site to build the resilience of the constant CO2 flow. As we don't know what will be the drivers of CO2 market, um, we will look into so far theoretical model for mini model for 2 million ton of CO2 shipping, and then we will scale it up as and when we will know more about this market. So what will impact ship design is uh, this uh, amount and quantity to transport, and we will take the X amount to transport from either on the route without stops or a route with different stops and 
more loading and unloading. Our result will project energy of this process, but also costs of this process. We are looking into different CO2 transportational conditions. Um, so whether uh, uh, the, the shore store will provide liquefaction or we will have possibly CO2 liquefaction on board, how much energy it will take. We do not want to produce emissions of CO2 by shipping CO2. So we will look into the zero emission shipping uh, using hydrogen, methanol scenario, then a little bit more conservative transitional LNG scenario, and uh, completely conventional using of diesel engines of MGO with a uh, possibility of capturing CO2 on board and storing it as we already have a store on board. So we'll look into how much energy that will take and what is the, const, uh, the cost of the whole process. Port supported operations are uh, very important. We'll look into the uh, energy within the port uh, operations and whether to provide a shore side electricity for ships, uh, depending again on the propulsion of the ship. So uh, to gain this expected results, we also need to take the consideration of uh, the voyage variables. Uh, so ship, shipping around the UK coast, um, what would be the maximal voyage length and how many stops and what can be the speed of the ships. As right now, we do have technology readily available to reduce emissions from ship right now if just all ships will go very, very slow. And our concept is that CO2 at this particular moment, nobody really wants it. So whether it comes to the end point quickly or slowly is not so important as for different other competitive products. So in this case, we will look into the speed of the CO2 shipping Perhaps ships might be also the, the way to temporarily store it while we ship them uh, CO2 very slowly. And the whole transportation system and uh, optimization of this transportation system that is done just in time or whether it's better to be um, on the economy of scale, size, or uh, this is all what we will produce in our results and you can expect that we'll tell you exactly how much energy the CO2 transport takes for 2 million metric tons from Solent area to Teesside. And then we can scale this model once it's, we have it to, to the uh, full transportation system. We will also include the life cycle of design of the ship and uh, different ships and what are the emissions uh, to produce those ships um, and what is the energy and what is the cost for each of these scenarios. Thank you very much. So now we've got the Northwest Cluster uh, and Rachel Sutton, who is also coming in remotely. So. Good morning, everybody. Um, and thank you very much for um, enjoy, join, inviting me to join you this morning. Um, and as Kirsty said, thank you very much for enabling my remote attendance. It's very much appreciated. Yeah, thank, thanks for taking the trouble to come in, Rachel. It's it's really appreciated. But uh, we know we know everybody in the Northwest Cluster is very busy. So. <laughs> Not a problem. Um, so so my name is Rachel Sutton. Um, I'm the project manager for the High Net Northwest project. So we're one of the Track One industrial clusters, and um, which is being delivered by a committed consortium of partners that you can see on the slide there on the right hand side. So HiNet addresses industrial decarbonisation in the Northwest and North Wales via two main routes. So the heart of the project itself uh, is at the Stanlow Manufacturing Complex at Ellesmere Port, uh, right there in the centre of the map, um, where a new joint venture, Vertex Hydrogen, is going to be producing low carbon hydrogen for distribution all across the region. The blue lines that you can see on the map there um, are our uh, hydrogen distribution network being developed by Cadent, which takes that hydrogen directly from Ellesmere Port to industrial users all across the region, um, who will then be able to fuel switch from traditional natural gas to using hydrogen instead. We also have opportunities for, for blending into local transmission systems for domestic and commercial heating opportunities as well. 
It's important to note here as well that the system is fully integrated with energy storage. So we have uh, salt cavities down in Northwich owned by Innovin, um, which will allow us to store the hydrogen, which is really critical for ensuring the network resilience as we're supplying our hydrogen users. Uh, more relevant for, for this forum, um, so our carbon capture store and storage element of the project is shown in orange on the map there. So you can see the main onshore pipeline, which runs from Ellesmere Port from the hydrogen production plants out to Point of Air um, on the northwest on the North Wales coast, um, at which point the CO2 goes offshore. So as well as capturing the uh, CO2 from hydrogen production, we've got nearly 20 emitters within the region as well who are eligible for cluster sequencing phase two, who've submitted into that, um, which includes um, our consortium partners, CF Fertilizers, Hanson Cement, um, and SR, who currently operate the um, Stanley manufacturing complex. So we'll take the opportunity with that CO2 pipeline running past these emitters to take that CO2 um, and take it offshore for storage. Once the pipeline goes offshore, um, that CO2 is going to be stored in ENI's uh, depleted gas reservoirs out in Liverpool Bay. So we have existing wellheads and platforms, as well as significant lengths of both onshore and offshore pipeline, which we're able to repurpose um, for CCS. I'll talk a bit more detail about that on the next slide. So here you can see the existing infrastructure. Um, so at the moment, E and I are currently producing um, oil and gas from the Douglas field. Um, and we have the Hamilton, Hamilton North and Lennox fields that you can see on the map there on the left hand side. So the Douglas platform is at the hub of the production um, where oil is exported um, for offshore loading. And the gas is exported from the wellhead platforms um, via offshore gas pipeline that runs from Douglas to the point of air gas terminal, which you can see on the bottom right hand side. And at that point, it joins um, the onshore gas pipeline, which currently runs across North Wales. These fields have been in production since the 90s, um, and they're now actually um, highly depleted and coming to the end of their economic life. So without repurposing, um, the assets would be decommissioned um, as soon as 2025. So this is an absolutely fantastic opportunity to, to reuse those assets, fork up um, CO2 storage, um, and it's so uh, perfectly located um, next to the market demand for decarbonisation as well. It also comes with um, really good cost and delivery, deliverability benefits um, versus new build facilities, um, both for offshore and onshore pipelines. The fields have a capacity of about 190 million tonnes of CO2 storage, but there's also significant future expansion opportunities um, further uh, north and west in the East Irish Sea. You can see just from the photos on the right there, we've got the, the Hamilton Wellhead platform and the Douglas Central Processing platform and also the point of air gas terminal, which will all be repurposed. In terms of time frame at the moment, E and I are working uh, very closely with the North Sea Transition Authority um, in order to establish the, the safe and permanent containment of the CO2. Um, and we hope to have a storage permit um, awarded in 2023. So we currently have over 14 million tonnes per year of CCS demand for HiNet um, from the, the applicants into the phase two of cluster sequencing. Um, our planned system capacity for the network is, is only 10 million tonnes per year from 2030. So you can see here that the pace of delivery is absolutely critical. Um, our focus at the moment is on um, the feed engineering and then the successful de um, determination of the various consents that we need for the CO2 pipeline and CO2 storage. Um, and we plan to take a final investment decision um, for the stages one to three, which is essentially up to the four and a half million tonnes per year case um, by 2023. The uh, system will uh, progressively expand over time um, in order to meet the demand. So we'll start at, at one million tonnes per year, uh, going up to two um, by the uh, mid-2026, uh, mid and then a ramp up to uh, four and a half million tonnes per year from 2026 to 2027. Um, and then we're looking to expand to 10 million tonnes per year uh, from 2030 onwards. Really closely aligned with this time frame is the delivery of the hydrogen system as well. So the first hydrogen production plant uh, planned to be up and running in 2026 with a capacity of 350 megawatts. Um, and that uh, hydrogen production capacity um, aligned with the hydrogen distribution network and the storage facilities um, will all, con all continue to increase with a planned total capacity of 3.8 gigawatts by 2030. You can see here across both hydrogen and CCS, HiNet is completely a demand-led cluster. Um, so we have industries all across the Northwest and North Wales who are absolutely committed to reducing their CO2 emissions and completely dependent um, on HiNet in order to achieve that. So the Northwest has a, a hugely rich industrial heritage um, and essentially HiNet enables all of those companies to continue to, 
to be successful and to grow um, into a net zero future. Hopefully that gave you a good overview of, of the HiNet project. I'll pass on to the next uh, presenter, but open to your questions during the panel. Thanks very much, Rachel. Uh, next, next presenter, Chris Williams from uh, the South Wales cluster. Yeah, Chris Williams, I work for Tata Steel, but seconded to Industry Wales um, to continue a leadership role for the South Wales Industrial Cluster. Industry Wales is an arm's length uh, body of Welsh Government. Um, so quick five minutes on South Wales Industrial Cluster. Um, as others have shown, one of the recognised industrial clusters, part of the mission, uh, part funded through Brian e Industrial Decarbonisation Challenge for Cluster Plan and Deployment Project uh, funding. As shown on the right-hand side, obviously in the south of the UK, so struggling with no, any known local geo geological storage of CO2. Um, I know people are investigating, so maybe something will come through, but at the moment, no known storage. So one of the clusters exploring um, or having to explore CO2 shipping. But of course, what that line represents on the right-hand side is uh, an industrial developing threat, as Matthew's mentioned, in terms of uh, industries in the north now will start to be, to be able to gain a competitive advantage over industries in the south because the industries in the north, because they'll be connected to hydrogen and CCS networks, will be able to make things in a net zero way and mar market their products in a net zero way, whereas industries in the south won't. So it's vitally important, of course, we're lobbying Bayes now to make sure that uh, CO2 shipping it's important, obviously, you get the stores up and running as quickly as you can, but in parallel, you need to get CO2 shipping capability up and running to make sure the South can then keep and catch up with the North. Otherwise, you end up with a huge transitional issues of uh, how do you move all your industries in the South up to the North? And do you really, have you got the skills and the people to do that? And is that really what you want to do as a, as a country? So we're exploring CO2 shipping. Um, South Wales, when we came together, um, thanks to the other clusters, we learned a lot off the over the other clusters during 2019, 2020. Um, we're a whole mix of different companies, steel, oil, cement, chemicals, nickel, insulation, paper, and, and oil mint, general, general manufacturing. About 100,000 people working there, and it contributes some, a, a large proportion of the £12 billion to uh, Welsh economy uh, through industry in that area. So it's important for Wales as a nation it's important for the UK, um, mostly multinational companies. As a region, when we started to come together and understand how we were going to decarbonize, we knew we had huge LNG import terminals. So about 20 to 30% of, of UK natural gas comes in through Milford Haven. We've got a huge tidal range. We've got huge floating offshore wind capabilities, but we've got no local geological storage of or no local geological storage of CO2. So we're going to have to explore CO2 shipping. So how do we come together to explore decarbonisation of our different sectors and our different companies with those opportunities, but that challenge of uh, no local geological storage of CO2? So a little bit like Matthew showed as well, we're, we're focusing on our different steps, as we call it, with five steps in terms of each industry taking them through a pathway to decarbonisation or to net zero, in terms of focusing on energy efficiency, resource efficiency typically is step one. Step two, then understanding the fuel switching, so electrification, hydrogen. Step three, in terms of symbiosis and what benefits we can bring from industrial symbiosis and maybe benefiting from clean growth opportunities there. Step four is how can we use the CO2 if we're still emitting it from our factories? Uh, what uses have we got locally for food and drink, et cetera? Um, but also through CCU technologies that are coming through. And then step five, where we have to, where we've still got CO2 being emitted, how do we capture that CO2 and how do we ship it away? So through the industrial decarbonisation cluster plan, we're going through that process with our different industries. And through the industrial decarbonisation challenge deployment project, we're doing engineering studies for some of the options we know we're going to need to, to uh, develop. As I mentioned, 20 to 30% of UK natural gas comes in through Milford Haven on the west there on the left-hand side. Um, so SWIC, South Wales Industrial Cluster, can help decarbonise the whole southwest of the UK, but of course not breaching into uh, to Lindsay's area. Um, but what is that natural gas going to look like? How does hydrogen 
conversion, what's the hydrogen economy look like for the South Wales area, but also the Southwest area. So blue hydrogen with CO2 shipping starts to become an immediate opportunity. Then we know we've got Celtic floating offshore wind with 10, 10 20, 30, 40 gigawatts electrical capability that will come online to so mass green hydrogen will come online. So blue hydrogen not only gets the hydrogen economy up and running locally, but also initiate CO2 shipping with some of our difficult to decarbonize industries, steel cement chemicals, and then utilize that CO2 shipping capability when it's up and running. So we started to develop that sort of regional net zero plan. And through the IPC program, with a series of partners, we're doing detail engineering design and all of those. I won't go through those, but uh, I'll leave the slide there in the pack. I suppose one of our leading projects is RWE with its Net Zero Pembroke Centre, UK's largest combined cycle gas turbine, 2.1 gigawatts at the moment, um, understanding how we decarbonise that, how we use blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, with floating offshore wind capability as well, to make sure our industries are fed with low-carbon power when it's not sunny, when it's not windy. When it is sunny and when it is windy, we've obviously got that renewables capability, but also that introduces and brings in CO2 shipping from that Western Mil Milford Haven area. Once we've got CO2 shipping capability, of course, we can start to move east and pick up our steel cement chemicals industry. So it's just an example here of Port Talbot, ABP, and what we're exploring there in terms of understanding what each of those geological areas look like, what the industries within those areas need in terms of CCS in particular, um, and how we then explore and decarbonize and take CO2 away. So just in the diagram there, it's just a CO2 ship as an example. But that's built within a local re regional development plan that incorporates building that floating offshore wind capability, building the platforms that will be taken out and used offshore. You might have seen CCSA's pathway report, and this, of course, fits in with uh, what Lindsay was presenting in terms of shipping CO2. So you can see the green bar at the top. Um, so we're hoping to be part of track two. Uh, so we're hoping to have CO2 ships leaving in 2028, um, and we'll be part of that green bar going forward. Thank you. So, um, uh, the last question, Andrew Woods. From Harbour Energy, who's going to talk about uh, alternative pipeline plans from Humberside, I think. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Hood. Uh, I'm the Subsurface and Wells Manager for Harbour Energy's VNet Zero project. Uh, it's a transportation storage project, and today we'll be talking about that and, and the overall cluster. Um, so, if we start by looking at the Humber area initially, uh, as a lot of you probably know, and as Ben has mentioned, the Humber region is the UK's uh, densest CO2 emitting region. It accounts for about 20 million tonnes of CO2 emissions per year. Uh, the majority of that is along the south bank of the Humber Estuary. And if you start to expand out to Goul and Drax, you get up to around 30 million tonnes of emissions per year. And then when you start taking the greater Lincolnshire, Lincolnshire area, uh, you, you exceed that number even further. So uh, as you can see, decarbonising the, the Humber area and the greater Lincolnshire area uh, has to be a key objective if the government wants to meet its, uh, its uh, objectives of, of, of net zero. Um, so if you look at the VNet Zero project, uh, initially it's outlined in, in the colours you can see in the screen. So the transportation storage system consists of a 50 kilometre onshore pipeline, which links the Immingham super place in the, in the Humber Estuary down to the Thettlethorpe gas terminal, and then repurposes the existing logs pipeline, which runs for 120 kilometres from Thettlethorpe out to depleted gas reservoirs in the Southern North Sea. Um, so as a cluster, we're working as a transportation storage system with um, our industrial partners of Humber Zero, um, that consists of the Phillips 66 Humber refinery, uh, VPI Immingham combined heat and power plant, amongst others. Uh, another thing to note here in terms of uh, keeping capacity in mind, I guess, is that we've been working with uh, Associated British Ports, um, another partner who own the busiest port complex in the UK in the form of the Port of Immingham. Strategically, that port sits right beside Immingham, so you can see what, how this area starts to kind of anchor itself as as an accessible place to, to site um, the start of a transportation system. Um, we've completed a pre-feed study on, on, on that shipping um, prospect and developed uh, the initial uh, 
design of a, of a CO2 import system uh, to link the port of Birmingham to the, to the transportation storage system. Because we plan to repurpose um, an existing pipeline, um, I, I, as we mentioned in other clusters, that is obviously a huge benefit in terms of cost to the cluster, and, and, and we believe it makes it a highly competitive prospect in the area. Um, we plan to be operational by 2027, so we're targeting first injection in 2027, final investment decision uh, end of next year, where we'll also be applying for our uh, storage permit. Um, if you look at the system's capacity overall, we plan to be transporting 11 million tonnes per year by 2029. That uh, equates to probably about 20% of the UK's car emissions. And by 2033, we plan to increase that transportation to 12.5 million tonnes per year. Um, and I guess the, the other additional uh, side of things here is that if we can prove that we have a, um, a reliable transportation storage system, it allows our industrial partners to start to invest in other projects like blue hydrogen generation, where they plan to generate 900 megawatts of thermal energy for the local housing area through blue hydrogen. So if we start to look at the offshore side of things, um, we're targeting depleted gas fields within the Southern North Sea. Um, we've been awarded uh, a carbon storage license by the, the North Sea Transition Authority, which you can see in the bottom right-hand side there. Um, the formations we're targeting are the Le Mans Sandstone Reservoirs. So they sit about 9,000 feet over the seabed. Um, to put it in another context, that's about two um, Ben Nevis mountains stacked up on top of each other. So very deep storage site. Um, we benefit as well because of that deep storage site of having secondary containment of uh, the Bunter Sandstone Saline Aquifer that sits above. And if you look at the coloured map on the bottom right, you can see that within the license area, the red and the grey dots are all of the discrete reservoir units that we have within our site. So we think overall within that site, there's about 300 million tonnes of storage capacity. Um, and as I mentioned, we also have the Bunter Sandstone closures, which you can see outlined in uh, the kind of red dotted lines. They sit about 4,000 feet below the seabed, so above the uh, initial storage sites. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on uh, subsurface characterization and containment. We operated uh, these license areas for the last 40 to 50 years. So we have a very good understanding of the subsurface, of the rock properties, of the legacy wells that exist within the area. Um, but I think if you look at the um, what this offers us from a capacity point of view, because of the nature of these reservoirs and because of the discrete units that we have, it gives us flexibility when we look at developing the, the license area and the storage site to account for uncertainties in emitter profiles, um, emitter schedules, and it allows us to, to um, I, I guess, absorb some of the risk that, that some of those um, upstream uh, issues could, could pose to us. Um, and obviously within there, there's multiple ways we can uh, scale up the site and, and, and multiple ways we can be flexible in how we develop the, the, the prospect. You look at the infrastructure side of things itself, um, there, there are two main parts uh, of, our, of our system, I guess, where you could have constraint and, and a reduction in capacity, or, or if you get this wrong, you, you may not meet capacity requirements. Um, so firstly, if we look at the offshore pipeline that we plan to repurpose, the logs pipeline, um, that pipeline is 36 inches in diameter. It's extremely robust. We, we installed that pipeline and we operated it. So we have good track record of the material, the raw material that, that created that pipeline. We have inline inspection <laughs> records and we know exactly the history of that pipeline. So we've done detailed engineering on fracture and corrosion assessment. Um, we plan to do an inline inspection on that pipeline next year to confirm those assumptions. Um, but I guess, in short, the main crux of the message here is that that pipeline has capacity for 30 million tonnes um, of dense phase CO2 transportation per year. Um, so that offshore pipeline in itself is not a constraint to capacity for this uh, cluster. Um, obviously, there's some other benefits there. It's an existing pipeline. Um, the Southern North Sea, as you can see from the map on the top there, is an area of scientific interest. And all of those coloured areas and hatched areas you can see are environmentally protected areas. So to relay a new pipeline across all those areas would certainly um, be a risk to schedule and, and an increased cost to the project. Um, and obviously because that's there, we remove all of those uh, schedule risks. So then if we look at the onshore side of things, where else could you constrain capacity within transportation storage system? We look at the onshore pipeline. Um, this is the, 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 the biggest piece of new infrastructure we'll be building. It sits in the critical path of the project. Um, and a lot of that is down to the develop, development consent order process, the planning process that we have to go through to build that pipeline. Um, the pipeline will be new. It will be designed for the purposes of transporting CO2 in the dense phase. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that we've started that development consent order, order process. 
Um, we've submitted our initial planning application and we're starting our, our, our first round of public consultations uh, for that. In terms of that pipeline, um, we believe that it is sized appropriately so that we uh, can comfortably transport the, the volumes of CO2 that we have line of sight to through our emitter partners. But there's also redundancy uh, within the sizing of that pipeline to be able to expand the cluster uh, to other emitters that, that are maybe not, not yet on the table. Um, so I, I know we're running out of time. So, so to summarise, um, I guess if you start looking at the emitter side of things in terms of capacity development, there's certainly uh, large volumes and diversity of emitter, emitter profiles within the Humber region. Uh, so that's not an issue. Uh, if you look at the system itself, the transportation system, there's robustness and there's extra capacity built into all aspects of that transportation system. And then when you combine that with the nature of the license area and the storage sites we have on the offshore end, uh, we have flexibility there to be able to adapt to changing emitter profiles and, uh, and, 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 and other things that may come into the system, such as shipping, uh, which I also mentioned. So uh, that's all I had for today. Uh, it was a very quick overview. I was trying not to run too much over time. But, uh, thank you very much. Um, thanks, everyone, for your very informative um, presentations. Uh, so my name is Mayam from Imperial College. Um, just asking about sort of this fe shipping featuring, featuring in a lot of these different clusters. And in terms of the design of these systems, have you kind of taken into account potential disruptions? So if a ship potentially can't make it or travel to the, the, this destination, whether the uh, the storage section of the um, supply chain is able to deal and handle with that variability? Hello, I'll be on. Yeah, not sure if tomorrow wants to kick off, but we can. This is certainly something that we have discussed as a project team. So very much aware, having sat there and watched all of the risk potentials, challenges in in pipelines, that the same sort of risks, albeit of a different type, will apply to ships as well. So while we're considering our scenarios, that's exactly what we consider different scenarios. So if is it a plan A to a source to a a, 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 a receiver? or various different uh, offshore uh, storage itself, um, but also what's the chances or what's the possibility of having potential offshore floating barges that could potentially hold temporary storage if something should happen. Um, different ports will have different size capacities for different ships. That will be something that needs to be considered. Um, and different ports will have different infrastructure space to accommodate for the respective amount of available as well. So there might be some smaller um, shipping ports that aren't necessarily considered in directly as one of our clusters, um, but they will feed in somehow. And it might be a small barge that has to somehow link up if that is the case, if pipelines can't accommodate. Um, yeah, so it is certainly something that we have to uh, A, consider and B, embed early on into our, our models and consider various different scenarios. I, I guess I was just going to add from a transportation storage side, um, it, it's important to understand what the transportation storage system looks like, uh, where the capacity lies within each part of that system, and also what the emitter profiles look like that that transportation storage system is dealing with. So, for example, if you have a, a system where you've got baseload emitters who operate 365 days a year, you know, 24-7, you have a constant supply of CO2. And if you can build into your transportation storage system some sort of redundancy, so for example, a larger pipeline that can take some line pack and, and, and can accommodate those smaller volumes of ship CO2, then, then it may not actually be uh, much of an issue uh, at the end of the day. Other questions? Thank you. Um, I have a question for, uh, for Matthew, but actually it's a question for everyone <laughs> uh, of the cluster. Um, given the, the problematic of moving CO2 uh, from small emitters, have you considered, uh, um, or is there any business case for a CO2 utilization or um, any other type of uh, a different use, alternative use of CO2? And I actually would be also interested to know for the large industrial cluster, how, do, how are they dealing with uh, small emitters of CO2? So I, I'll answer. Uh, briefly, and then maybe the others want to come in. So yes, we are, is, is the short answer. We're looking at, um, I mentioned vertical farms, so local use of, of carbon as much as possible. We still have an issue with um, getting sufficient scale. So we have, to, we have to bring businesses together onto a, a single site, for example, to make that work really economically, because everything, you know, cost, 
these things are all new. Um, and then we're hitting issues with land, uh, land availability and uh, energy connections. So it, so it takes you into a whole world of challenges, <laughs> which we talk about environmental ones, that, that we're having to unlock, that there needs to be a new industrial business model that, for all these things to make it work. If, if I may ask, are you considering CO2 mineralization, for instance, as an option for uh, so local I didn't, storage? I didn't catch that. CO2 mineralization as a kind of local storage? Uh, yeah, I think, I, think, I, think, I think we are. Apologies. Okay. For, yeah. okay. I'll just add. Uh, I think it's a good question as well, because um, when we first started looking at, I suppose, all our regions, um, you look at the difficult to decarbonize the big industries. You've got economies of scale there to collect uh, and, and things work out financially. But the smaller industries and the industries away from the coast um, then start to become the, the difficult challenge. Um, and as Matthew said, each one is individual. I think probably most of them will be able to electrify or convert to hydrogen um, and, and potentially local green hydrogen production, depending where they are away from the coast. Um, and CCU or CCS won't be needed. Uh, but where it is, yeah, yeah, we're exploring, we're, we're developing the, we're exploring options with a growing number of to you opportunities, really starting to understand what we can gain and develop from those. Uh, Rachel or Kirsty, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to contribute. So um, although not part of the, the core high net infrastructure that we're looking at delivering um, by 2025, we are looking at CO2 aggregation possibilities. So we have a, a small site um, very closely located to, um, to Ellesmere Port and where we're looking at, at CO2 aggregation, some by road transport and um, some by pipeline from a number of much smaller um, emitters in the region. Um, we're working with a, a company called, called Protoss at the potential for um, capture as a service. So it is something that we're exploring, which will enable some of those uh, smaller emitters to tie into the CO2 pipeline. Um, as I said, it's not part of our, our core infrastructure delivery in the short term, um, but absolutely something that we're looking to work with. We're also looking wider as well. So one of our um, satellite projects, if you want to refer to it, is, is looking at the, the peak cluster. So there's a lot of CO2 emissions coming out of um, particularly um, cement um, and minerals in the peaks. And we're looking at whether we can aggregate CO2 from those companies and, and actually um, build a, a new pipeline running from there to join into the larger pipeline uh, based in the northwest. So we're certainly looking at future expansion opportunities beyond just Ellesmere Port and, and the local area. Just a, a, well, we got you, Rachel. There's a question came in on the uh, from the remote viewers about how you actually got the uh, the quantity estimates that you had. Yes, I was just uh, typing an answer, but I'll, I'll answer it live instead. That would be much easier. Um, yeah, so the question was, um, how did we come up with the capacity targets for the various stages? Um, those capacities aren't actually targets, they're technical constraints. Um, so that very first stage is essentially defined by the point at which, at which we need no intermediate compression, just the compression at the point of emission. Um, so that'll end, that's uh, possible while the reservoirs are at very low pressure. But as that reservoir pressure builds, um, we are going to start needing compression and gas cooling um, first off at point of air, which is our next step. And then at stage three is when we start needing pressure control and heating um, at the Douglas platform. And we'll also need some um, additional pipelines as well. So those stages have been um, technically defined from a, an efficiency, from a cost perspective um, and from a technical constraint perspective. Um, to allow us to build up and make the investment at the most sensible opportunities as the system capacity continues to grow. The questions, there's a question here, was there? Can I, can I come back to the question? Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry yeah. Just thinking. Uh, I suppose that question, again, is a good question, <laughs> um, draws out a uh, concern that we've really got with what UK government are developing in terms of business models and support industries will be given to get to net zero. <laughs> So there's no support for electrification. We've got the highest electricity price industry pays um, in Europe. Um, but if you convert to hydrogen, you'll be supported in that conversion and you'll be supported with the cost of hydrogen going forward potentially. Yeah. But you're using electricity potentially to create that hydrogen where you could just electrify your process. So you're being driven down the least efficient route um, by policy. 
So there's some real concerns around those smaller sites that things are going to be driven in a way that means the UK will be worse off in, in terms of its productivity matrix, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, thanks. No, thanks. That's a, a useful point. Um, yes, so, yeah, okay, sir. So got the microphone. Uh, Toby Lockwood. Yeah, hold, hold it, hold it near the top. Otherwise, it might. Uh, that's it. Uh, Toby Lockwood, clean air task force. Uh, this might be sort of sensitive or issue, but just wondering about the kind of um, relationship between the two Humber clusters and whether there's kind of competition there or a problem around uncertainty over which volumes are going where. Uh, whether the the kind of um, yeah, whether that requires more sort of policy coordination to help your planning. Is the VNet Zero kind of aiming to be a track two cluster and maybe pick up volumes which are further down development or, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> which of you two gentlemen want to go first? Um, I, can, I can go first. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so for, <clears throat> for, for the uh, Humber cluster, as, as we mentioned, uh, demand is uh, greater than the storage uh, capacity. And in some sense, you know, we need uh, optionality, right? I think everything I've heard so far about whether it's smaller industries or kind of larger industries or clusters, you know, who's advantaged or not, uh, given the kind of number of options and all of the options that's required as part of the energy transition, uh, wouldn't it be, it be great for the humble industries to have options uh, to go to either one? Uh, so, Personally, I don't see it as a as competition, you know, on behalf of the East Coast cluster. In fact, in our East Coast cluster submission bid, we actually referenced VNet Zero and, uh, and referenced uh, collaboration with VNet Zero, uh, recognizing that we are a storage capacity constraint. Mm. And uh, I suppose the question is, have you got a, a planned link in are you, somewhere around Immingham? Because we're, we're close by the river crossing. I guess uh, that, that's, a, that's another uh, question that, that hasn't been considered yet, I don't think, by, by either, either party. Because um, the, the, the two pipelines must go quite close, right? Yep. Within a mile or so, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I guess the difference is they both go to different, uh, one's going north somewhat and one's yeah. going south, yeah. um, which is where the difference lies in terms of the storage sites. Um, I, I think in terms of you know, competitiveness, obviously we're in a, we're in a competitive uh, competition at the moment with, a, with the cluster sequencing. Um, and congratulations to, to NEP and, and to Hynet on being awarded track one. We did apply for that last year. We went through that process and it was uh, intense and uh, challenging. So um, we do pl plan to apply for track two this year. Um, but yeah, I, I echo what Ben said. I think if you look at the Humber, there is more than enough supply of CO2 uh, to, to be dealt with. And I think if you look at the investment that uh, industry and government are going to be making in these technologies, the capture technologies and the transportation and storage systems, it can only be a good thing if you have a diversity of emitter supply and also a diversity of storage sites. Because let's also remember that um, at scale CO2 injection on the scales we're talking here has not commonly been done across, across the globe. So there are technical risks that exist with, with all of these clusters that we're speaking about. Just one, one last point to add. So with the previous CCS competitions, uh, prior to the cluster sequencing process, I think industry was very clear that a key lesson learned other than to kind of split the, uh, the chain, uh, was to encourage collaboration for a nascent industry, not competition. So offshore wind would not have been successful in the UK if uh, the government tried to kind of pit everyone against each other. It's not how you start an industry. Right, uh, Dr. Sang from University of Nottingham. Uh, I've got a question, don't know if it's commercially sensitive or not. So we have see some information from different clusters. I don't see any cluster okay, reveal any information about the cost of CO2 transport and storage. We have some estimate quite a few years ago, but given the last few years development, so I would be uh, very interested to say what is the latest estimate of CO2 transport costs or storage. On the basis, for example, uh, XX pounds per ton of CO2 transport or stored. Okay. Uh, my second question is, we have seen quite a few clusters. Geographically, they are considerably different. Do these clusters offer some kind of uh, CO2 
cost uh, benefit. So I don't know if the panel members have any idea uh, at this stage. We want to. Yes. Well, so thank you very much for this question. It's a, a question that we were asking to uh, everyone uh, during the session. Uh, the cost of CO2 and the cost of transportation will be the part of our model that we're developing. Uh, it is still not known what will be the drivers behind the cost of CO2, uh, how, the, uh, how it's going to, whether the polluters are going to be charged for it. Or uh, we heard in the presentations today that maybe even taxpayers are going to be charged for it. So it is to be seen. In the meantime, we are developing a techno-economical model, which will um, define the cost of transportation based on the energy needed to, uh, to transport CO2 based on the life cycle of ships. Um, be looking in a non-pipeline transportation. And hopefully, uh, in the meantime, there will be other studies to define other types of land-based and pipeline transportation, which will all then be combined to define that price. Right. That only so, answers part of the question. But, okay, well, but specifically, I, I, I guess the clusters with, with pipelines are not disclosing what they're charging at the moment. That... Yes, I, I can I can say at the moment as part of cluster sequencing, I'm, I'm sure the other clusters are in the same position. We are actually under commercial non-disclosure agreements with Bayes, so that isn't something that we're yeah, living that's, in. That's what I would have thought. So I, I guess we'll find out eventually, but, uh, <laughs> right. uh, but okay. not now. Right. Um, and then just just on the uh, the questions, I see uh, maybe I'm missing something else. I, I see Haroon has got his hand raised. I think. Um, yeah, it's just just a comment from Haroon on uh, on shipping speed. It, Looking at, looking at evaporation in shipping transport and, and speed of ships, is that a or road transport? Is that something that people are looking at much? Yes, so, so uh, we will be modeling the optimal ship speed um, for, for CO2 transportation. And uh, based on the evaporation, um, it affects the uh, design of the ship in terms of ship stability. As the CO2 evaporates, uh, we can have a sloshing within the tank, which can affect stability of the ship. So we're looking into um, different stages, but there is a, like a C-type tank allows different uh, uh, allows uh, that uh, the tank is half full. So we're looking into the risks of the shipping and. Uh, the final uh, optimization of the design, but when in terms of speed, uh, it also is defined from propulsion. If it's a conventional propulsion uh, using diesel engines, um, then it's better that ships are very slow for energy saving and for emissions. Um, however, if you're using hydrogen, um, we'll we'll look into the different ship design, more lean, maybe for the faster ships, um, because hydrogen is difficult to store, so we don't have enough. Uh, uh, however, CO2 ships will, will provide uh, enough space for that. So this is all in, in a technology that is developing. Okay. No answers to give yet. Okay. Uh, I've got a, a very quick final question because we're getting to the end of the time. Um, leaving aside the... Teesside and, and Humberside, which are, are proposed to be joined up. Where do people think the, the first pipeline connections between clusters will go in in the UK? So we've got we've got independent clusters, but where we've got a pipeline connection between the two, two clusters. Where, where do you think that'll be, Ben? Let's just go on. Where, where, where do you think it'll be? The sort of you know strategic intercluster connector. Is this related to your question about future system operator yesterday? It could be, but I mean, you know, it's just, but it's just a straightforward question. You know, we, we, we're thinking about it as discrete, but where, where will we start to join them up? Honestly, I have no idea, right? Because I, th <clears throat> I think as we get into feed and we get into the next stage of detailed design, mm. uh, what we are finding out is uh, there's, there's quite a lot at, uh, of uh, transportation and storage at scale that is being developed and I think until we get something that is working in the ground, okay. right, that will inform how, how best to do the next connection. Because uh, currently, 
base working with the with Hynet and with uh, NEP to develop the network code. And then I think that that will code will set a standard on which we can then work how the clusters will be interconnected. Okay, and then coming along, Chris, where, where would you uh, put a pipeline to from South Wales if you're going to if you're going to put in the strategic pipeline so you're actually plumbed in? Where would you want to go? Norway. Is <laughs> <laughs> they're going to offer us the lowest cost? And I'll leave it up to the other clusters. Coming back to the cost question, <laughs> which is why nobody will talk about cost. No, I, I suppose it makes sense that it would for us it would be the closest. Yep. Um, but where there are capacity and you know we don't really yet know what a UK shipping fleet will look like and how it will operate. Yeah, but I'm, I'm talking about a pipeline. You know, ah, yeah, sorry, yeah, pipeline. drifting back on the ships. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, w- I would say uh, up northwest. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thanks. And, uh... Where do you want to connect to if you're not? To... It, it, it's a good question, and I don't think I have the answer for you. But I guess um, one thing you have to consider if you did ever want to connect up pipelines is is there needs to be some sort of commonality of CO2 specification from all of the emitters that feed into that pipeline, mm. and and it, the 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 CO2 specification also then needs to go on and be compatible with the transportation storage systems uh, either onshore or offshore. So it, it, it's a good question. It's a good desire, uh, but I think. It, it will take a much wider conversation about agreeing on common specifications for CO2 transportation in terms of impurity levels, in terms of delivery pressure, delivery temperature, and that type of thing. Mm. Mm. Okay. And would, it, would a pipeline solve the problems of the, the black country? I, I'm not, a pipeline alone would not do it because we're, we're still very distributed across the black country or the wider um, West Midlands. So I think it, it's, it's not necessarily a solution in its own right. We're looking at whole national network. Yeah, and Lindsay, are you going to put a pipeline uh, around, pick up uh, Thames on the way and head up north? Ambitious. <laughs> um, not shipping's really been the forefront of the discussions for us. Um, because we do have a distribution of uh, companies, small, medium enterprises, all keen to decarbonize on their own as well. Um, well, I say on their own, in their own uh, agendas, there will be to some extent some element of ship um, uh, pipeline between these distributed um, units, but that's not necessary to another cluster. But then also that hangs into question if there's going to be a hydrogen network, is fuel switching actually more appropriate rather than the capture at an isolated location uh, for some of these smaller units as well? Um, so, yeah, I think it's still something very early on that we need to be considering. But if once we to couple the shipping with it, then I think we'll be in a better position to give you a firmer answer on that one. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, oh, yeah, Rachel. So, yeah. yeah. No, I'm happy to jump in on that. I think I'd echo yeah. uh, what Ben said as well in terms of the development of the network code and the business models. I think a lot of what happens in the future will be led by that. Um, my gut feel is that a, a big pipeline distribution network probably isn't the eventual solution um, for CO2 storage. I think shipping is probably more likely. There's a lot of technicalities that need to be considered, such as CO2 spec, which has been mentioned, but also flow assurance, intermediate compression, um, all of that, which is very specifically designed to each cluster. Um, so it won't necessarily be straightforward just to tie in a, a new pipeline at a future future date. Um, but I think actually the, the business models around a, a collaborative distribution network would be uh, quite complex to develop. So I think we're still some way off doing that and, and shipping may well be an easier solution in the short term. Specific question though, if you get as far as um, Hope Valley Cement, close to Sheffield, you know, mm-hmm. you're already on going downhill now to get to uh, to get to Humberside. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the, the, who knows, it might be that the, the peak cluster have choices and they could go to Pinet or they could yeah. go to, to yeah. Northeast. But I think actually having a, a single network where all of the various emitters are, are joined up together um, seems, seems less likely. I suppose it depends who takes over whom, doesn't it, in the longer run? <laughs> Could be some consolidation. Kirsty, sorry. I was just going to say, I think possibly first instances getting the, the clusters established would be would be the most important first step in those pipelines that we need for the if I remember correctly clusters. there was there was talk of a pipeline from Teesside up to uh, up to Scotland wasn't there as well so that that connection has been considered in the past I think I think I could be wildly wrong and if James is in the audience he's going to correct me um but the I think one of the feeders may possibly go close to it anyway okay 
Not sure. Yeah. James is in the audience, is that? It's James Schwartz, yeah. James? Yes, he says. Okay. All right. There you go. So, My so, knowledge is not completely forgotten. <laughs> so, so, there, so there is some possibility, but it, I mean, it does sound like it, I don't know whether it's idealistic, but to think about possible compatibility before everything gets locked in could be useful. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, you really better stop there, I think. Um, thank you very much. It's, it's great, great uh, discussion, guys. Thank you. Uh, final final uh, talk from Brian D. Livesey, who's, uh, I guess, the host of the party, really, as the, uh, as the director for the Industrial Decarbonisation Challenge. Um, started things going, uh, funded uh, a lot of projects. And uh, I, I guess you're going to tell us how much money is now being spent uh, in various places to actually turn this into reality. So please, uh, Brian, the floor is yours. So I have the um, honour to lead the Industrial Decarbonisation Challenge, which is £210 million of public money, uh, which aims to kickstart the decarbonisation of the industrial clusters. And you've heard from those today, so I don't need to take you through what they're actually doing. What I was going to do now is just reflect a little bit on where we are and what we believe we're delivering so first of all, policy. Uh, within the Industrial Decarbonisation Challenge, we do not um, write government policy, of course, but what we are doing is making it possible for the government policy to actually become a reality. So when the challenge kicked off in the middle of 2019, it was policy to have the world's first net zero industrial cluster by 2040. That felt really ambitious. But in a very, very short space of time, you know, less than two years, um, we had a massive increase in ambition to having four major industrial regions substantially decarbonized by the end of this decade, which is fantastic. And um, because we have the Industrial Decarbonization Challenge and so many successful projects as part of it, that policy has been able to be put in place. And then, of course, we have all of the projects that are running around the UK. You've heard from them. Um, the orange ones on this map are our cluster plans. Um, the green ones are the big deployment projects, which are developing the infrastructure for CCS and for hydrogen production and use, and then all supported by the Industrial Carbon Decarbonisation Research and Innovation Centre, which you heard from yesterday. So what is it about um, this field of work that justifies this massive public investment. £210 million is a lot, but of course there's also the massive investment that's going in from industry because all of these public costs are more than matched by the industry partners, so we're talking about a £500-ish million pound programme of work. I guess it's justified on a number of bases. First of all, um, half of the UK's industrial emissions are in these clustered regions. So if we can decarbonise those, that has a material impact on CO2 production. But secondly, it's really important for the UK that these industrial regions continue to thrive. And we see clusters as providing a platform for really um, allowing us to aggregate demand for energy um, share risk and resources across a region and really encourage economic growth and jobs and all these good things in the cluster regions as they move into the next decades. So clusters are not random um, clusters of organisations. I mean, they do have a structure. It's very important that they can demonstrate cooperation between the businesses in the region. It's important that we have some kind of means of jointly deciding what the infrastructure should look like so that it meets the needs of the whole region. We want the clusters to have some societal benefit um, and that um, public funding priorities will recognise the needs of these clusters and that they recognise the industries in their region all need to decarbonise. It's not just a favoured few in the region that need to be looked after. And then, of course, there is the need to think about supply chains and jobs. Quite an ambitious set of targets, but I think the important thing to recognise is that this is actually government strategy. It's not just a random set of words on the slide that I made up. I took these words directly from the industrial decarbonisation strategy that came out last year. 
And I think we can feel really proud that, you know, we have in the UK um, a real sense of the value of these clusters and their important economic and social impacts. So um, what I think um, is important for success uh, as an element of it is that we share what we're doing with other people and we do very much encourage the clusters to share with each other and also to share internationally. And this slide is taken from a recent meeting of the World Economic Forum. Um, some of you may know that they have set up um, a grouping to look at how to develop um, industrial clusters and help them to decarbonize. And two of the foundation <laughs> clusters, that's two out of four foundation clusters are in the UK, which is fantastic for us, I think, because they're able to share their learnings internationally. <laughs> and I think, I think it's great that you know, we've got the Northwest cluster and we've got the East Coast cluster participating in this and really seeing us being flagships for what's going on in America, Australia, Europe, and so on. So when people are talking to us about what can we actually share with them, what can they learn, I think it perhaps useful for us to reflect on what are we known for in our UK industrial clusters. The first thing I think is that we are actually doing this. We're not just talking about it. You know, lots of people have been talking about it for a long time, but we are getting on with it. People particularly value the governance of the structures, that it's a very informal arrangement, that clusters can expand. They're not fixed entities. They can change their structures, bring in new people. And we're seeing all of that, you know, very live in the projects that we're funding. And so they add new partners um, and we make it possible for all of that to happen. And I think that's very helpful that the clusters in their earliest stages are very flexible entities. And then we encourage, of course, um, very broad stakeholder engagement in the clusters. So lots of technical interaction, but also interaction with local authorities on planning and stuff like that, which I think is, has been really valuable. But overwhelmingly, the message that comes to me from people in other countries, and we had the experience um, talking to people in, in Texas for the Gulf Coast cluster and in California quite recently, what they overwhelmingly recognize is that we are putting the social impacts of these clusters and decarbonization at the heart of the program, not making it just an add-on. So we talk about the benefits for people, we talk about the benefits for jobs, the skills, the new opportunities for people, and just kind of make that part of the project as we're explaining what we're doing. And, and a lot of people are recognizing that that is going to be really valuable in helping them to take their own cluster projects forward. And I suppose the other thing that, you know, we could say we're known for is, is um, you know, that we've been recognised in, in government as, as perhaps developing this in a way which has been helpful for industry and policy development. So particularly, I thought I wanted to pick out the hydrogen story. So when uh, about, it's probably about five years ago now, when the UK CCSRC was um, going to the EPSRC to renew its grant, uh, John very kindly invited me to represent UK industry at that meeting and say, yeah, we really want this centre. Uh, but to my um, total astonishment, he asked me to present a slide on you know, what the impact of hydrogen production was going to be on the requirements for CCS. And it, it was total news to me that this was really exciting, interesting, important. And look at us now, you know, it's complete change in, in the situation. But for me personally, I've gone from really not knowing anything much about it to being invited, if that's the right word, by government to lead the competition process for the Net Zero Hydrogen Fund, which launches on Monday next week. And we are leading the first two strands of that competition. And what we've been able to do is bring in some of the competition processes that we had for the industrial decarbonisation challenge. So thinking about some of these social impacts, the broader impacts of these projects on the community will be at the heart of part of the selection process, not just the technology and the cost, which I think will be really valuable. So I just wanted to wrap up by um, saying thank you. I think um, I've been involved in these meetings for a long period of time. 
a lot of what I have learned has come from here. And a lot of what I think is important has come from here as well. So particularly, I would pick out you know, the importance of thinking about things in a very integrated way, not just adding social impacts, for example, onto what you do, but making it at the heart. And I think, you know, it's particularly pleasing to me to hear Ben talking about, you know, the EDI impacts of the East Coast cluster, because, you know, in all of our project meetings, we do ask people, what are you doing? What impact are you having? And it's good that people start to talk about this more. So I really value what I've learned here. There is nothing in the industrial decarbonisation challenge we can do to help our projects to actually deliver. Technically, they're all being delivered by excellent companies who are doing the right thing. What we are trying to do is make sure that we influence the how we do it as much as the what. And then a final thank you to the UK CCSRC leadership, particularly in the last couple of years we've been through. I feel that um, the way you've managed to keep everything going and continue to build this amazing community is something I've really, really valued. The webinars have been a lifeline <laughs> to the extent that I was almost disappointed yesterday when I heard they were only going to be monthly rather than weekly, which I got used to. So, And I know it's been a tremendous amount of effort to make that really work. And, and I think it's been very helpful for all of us to be able to um, continue to enjoy um, you know, meeting together virtually and then just have the great pleasure of coming back here today. So thank you very much. Thanks very much for all your support, Friday, and, uh, and yes, uh, getting the, the, the grant that we've, uh, we're just coming to the end of. So it's a happy memory. Um, so it's just a few things to do before we can go for lunch. Um, I need to uh, announce the winners of the ECR poster competition. Uh, and if they can come to the front and get their uh, certificates, which entitle you to uh, a £250 professional development bursary. So uh, we'll, we'll just get everybody down at once, if that's OK. So uh, the winners are Muir Freer from University of Manchester, uh, Katrin Harris from Imperial College London, and Adam Butler from the University of Cambridge. And then I think it's... Uh, I'm only left to say that uh, I'm looking forward to meeting you all again in Edinburgh in September, date to be confirmed. So uh, I hope we get uh, as good a weather on that part of the East Coast as we do here, but uh, I think September could be quite spectacular. So let's see you there. And then finally, I've got to say thank you as well. So thank you, obviously, to Karis and the team for organising this seamlessly. I, I do absolutely nothing at these meetings but turn up and be confused like everybody else. But this is, it, it's, uh, it's really good. They haven't forgotten over, over two and a half years how to run a meeting. In fact, I think they've uh, picked up a number of tricks from the uh, extended work on, on running virtual meetings to make this the first conference we've had where we've had really significant virtual input. And I hope, I hope for the people listening in, it's, it's been a good experience. Um, we've certainly appreciated having half as many people again attending remotely and Really looking forward to doing that in the future. Um, to support that, thank you very much for the IT team. And uh, thank you very much for the photographer. It's, uh, it's been, been great to have all this happening very seamlessly. And I'm sure we'll all thank the hospitality people at Sheffield for giving us a great time here. Um, I've really, really enjoyed using the diamond for, for the work, for the uh, meeting. And uh, we had a great time at Firth Court yesterday. And then finally, um, conferences only happen because people come. So thank you to everybody. <laughs> For coming along, taking part, all of the contributors, all of the speakers, all of the presenters, and, and all of the people who just participated in the audience. So thanks very much. I uh, hope we've had a good time. Conference is closed.